Tejasvinavaditamastu Mavidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 May the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the Divine Being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace, peace, peace. Peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. Namaste. Namaste. Um, for those of you who don't already know, Swami Yogeshananda passed away peacefully 10 days into his 99th year. Our much beloved Swami left the body on Saturday morning, February 13th, 10 days after his 98th birthday. Surrounded by the near and dear in his room at the Trubuco Monastery in Southern California, his transition was peaceful and uneventful. Swami Yogeshananda founded the Eternal Quest when he settled here in the early 1990s. The organization began, became the Vedanta, the Vedanta Center of Atlanta in 1999 when his congregation moved to Tucker, a suburb of Atlanta. Please join us in celebrating this extraordinary monk of the Ramakrishna order and his many contributions to Vedanta in the West. You can read about his pre-monastic and monastic life in a, a fine obituary written by Swami Mahayogananda. There's a link on the homepage of our website and on the center's Facebook page Many of you knew the Swami well and enjoyed years of spiritual life and growth with him. Please share your fondest memories of him with us. Email a copy of your favorite picture of Yogeshanandaji to info at vedantaatlanta.org and or along with a story or two about how he affected your life. We will use what you send to design memorials for the center's website and Facebook page. A memorial service for Swami Yogeshananda will be held sometime soon on Zoom. You will be notified immediately when the date and time are set so you can be part of that heartwarming event. You can watch the Swami's cremation service, which was held last Friday on the Vedanta Society of Southern California's YouTube channel. If you don't look that up, there will be a link posted with the notes for this talk. As you know, today's topic has to do with chapter three of the Gita. Uh, I've been mentioning the, that chapter to a lot of people, suggesting that they read it. Uh, and uh, some people uh, responded, well, why don't you talk about it a little? So here's the context. February is a month for the study of karma yoga a spiritual path leading to, the, leading to the abandonment of selfishness. As a karma yogi, you practice offering your actions and their results 
as well as your perceptions, thoughts, and feelings to the divine presence. Even before fully knowing this presence, you hold firmly to the belief that the presence, that this presence is within each person or living being that you interact with or serve. Working and abiding in this spirit, you are increasingly able to release attachment to your activities and their results. This yields the freedom and contentment promised by Karma Yoga. And here's one of Krishna's promises from chapter two of the Gita. Even a little practice of this yoga will save you from the terrible wheel of rebirth and death. This is what Sri Krishna said. Even a little practice of this yoga will save you from the terrible wheel of rebirth and death. That's in toward the end of chapter two of the Gita. This morning, we will talk about chapter three of the Gita, titled Karma Yoga. In this chapter, Sri Krishna defines the yoga of action and, is, and explains what is asked of an aspirant who practices it. Krishna's explanation includes what Swami Vivekananda spoke of as the secret of work. Swami Vivekananda spoke of what Sri Krishna says in chapter three of the Gita as <coughs> the secret of work. This may answer many of your questions about this past. So before we go ahead, so that I will know what to more particularly address as we develop these ideas from chapter three. Are there any comments or questions that you'd like to make about karma yoga? What you, how you see this idea of offering your actions and your thoughts and your perceptions, all of these things. Is there anything that you would like to uh, say uh, from your perspective? or ask. May I, Brother Shankar? Of course. Namaste. Hi, I am uh, Manjula Amber. I'm a friend of Hyman Naidu. I live in Virginia. I did attend a couple of lectures. Thank you so much. Namaste. Namaste. Um, I am um, I like Bhagavad Gita. I wouldn't say I read it all the time. <clears throat> I have read the English version of chapter three. Mm -hmm. My thought or first comment for you to comment on, uh, one of the things that struck me uh, in chapter three is the actions as per our gunas. And what may be the right action for a certain guna person may not be the right action for another guna person. Um, I would want you to comment on that. So depending on where you are in life, I guess in from previous lives and you were like, for example, one of the things I remember is like the karma of butcher is not right for a different kind of profession, what he does. But for him, <clears throat> though by action that is not right, killing or hurting, but that is the right, maybe dharma or karma for him. I don't know whether I'm expressing right. Thank you for listening. And if you could give your thank insight. You, thank you for that request and it will be addressed directly. Thank you. I won't, I won't answer right now. Uh, the, but it will be as part of the discussion of the gunas and what Sri Krishna says about the gunas. Thank you. Thank you for volunteering that. That's, that's excellent. Anything else from anyone? Yes, Brother Shankar, I just want to remark real quickly. Um, I'm amazed how Krishna says anyone who 
practices only a little karma yoga can escape the wheel of death and rebirth. Yes, it is an amazing promise, isn't it? And he makes just one qualification as we'll go along, we'll see what that is. But, but thank you for remarking on that, Aaron. It is a stupendous promise. Anything else from anyone? All right. As with so many of the chapters in the Gita, <clears throat> chapter three opens with a question from Arjuna. Now it's good for us to keep in mind that Arjuna is a spokesperson for us all. His questions should and do mirror our own. And the question that he asks at the beginning of the Gita, uh, ch chapter three of the Gita, indicates that he has not yet understood what Krishna told him in chapter two. He hasn't understood Krishna's most fundamental statement. Arjuna is not the doer. God alone is the doer. Because what Arjuna asks, he says, well, you say that knowledge of Brahman is the highest, and you ask me to do these terrible deeds. You're confusing me. No, <laughs> Krishna isn't confusing him. He remains confused, which of course is our natural condition because we live in ignorance. But the fundamental proposition that Krishna says is that you are not the doer. God alone is the doer. So because Arjuna has not understood, Krishna goes back to a review of principles. The first is addressing Arjuna's question directly. He says, you cannot not act. You cannot not act. You are helplessly forced to act by the gunas. So this addresses the comment that was made earlier. The gunas are not something that has to do with us individually. They give rise to our individual actions and our individual thoughts and our perceptions. As a matter of fact, they give rise to everything that this action and experience suit, this body-mind complex, everything that you experience or do is as a result of the gunas. This is Krishna's assertion. This is his statement. So when Arjuna asks, you ask me to do these terrible deeds. No, Krishna has already told him in chapter two, you're going to do these terrible deeds, regardless of what the outcome is, whether you're victorious or uh, or fail in your attempt. You're going to do this. So the gunas are a force of nature. They are the creation of the divine to make maya actually happen. Maya is not a thing. Maya is a statement of facts about what existence is. <clears throat> uh, Swami Vivekananda exp explains this very thoroughly in Jnana Yoga. 
So what we're looking at as we look out into the world is what the gunas have produced for us due to our pre-existing karma and who we are, our character, as we exist in this moment. As was pointed out, what is appropriate for a butcher is not appropriate for a Brahmin or for a, a, a business executive or for a doctor or whatnot. But as Swami Vivekananda points out in his talks on Karma Yoga, there is something called the Butcher's Gita, which is the story of an illumined soul who was a butcher. Now, none of this is meant, I, I emphasize this again and again, none of this is meant as personal instruction for you. You're not expected to do anything as a result of what's said here this morning. The hope is that you will take this in as Shravana, something you have heard, and you will evaluate it based on your own intelligent will. We'll get to the nature of the intelligent will. And then having done that manana, that taking this into your mind, then you will make whatever adjustments if you see fit to your thoughts which result then in your speech and your action so this is not meant for you personally any more than the gunas are meant for you personally this is meant as a statement of principles given by krishna and he says if you do these things this will be the result and we'll get to that as we go along. So his immediate response to Arjuna is, you cannot not act. You are helplessly forced to act by the gunas. And to understand what the gunas are in more depth, please read something of Sankhya philosophy because it's the frame of reference from which Krishna speaks. And a very nice and tidy description of it is at the back of Swami Prabhavananda's uh, translation of the Gita uh, in an appendix called the Cosmology of the Gita. He gives a brief but very concise summary of Sankhya philosophy and the nature of the gunas what they are and how they work and the fact that they are responsible for everything that this action and experience suit that we are the dweller within experiences and does so sri krishna says so go ahead and act go ahead and act as you must but with self-control, and that self-control is motivated by the intelligent will, the buddhi. <clears throat> now, if you study Sankhya, <clears throat> we see that there is only one <clears throat> intelligent will, just as there is only one eye-maker, ahamkara, these devolve from the great cause, the great, mm, the, the, yes, the great cause. But these things are reflected in us. The buddhi, the intelligent will, that which can tell one thing from another, this source of discrimination is one and it is reflected in one of the aspects called a kosha of this action and experience suit. So act 
but with self-control motivated by your sense of, your knowledge of, the direction and decisions of the intelligent will, the buddhi. This is a quote from the from chapter three. The world is imprisoned in its own activity, except when actions are poor, performed as worship of God. So this is one of the ways that the buddhi will direct you if you gain access to the buddhi. The world is imprisoned in its own activity, except when actions are performed as worship of God. And I mentioned earlier the subject, the secret of work, as, as it is described by Swami Vivekananda. This is the secret of work. Do work as worship. The world is imprisoned in its own activity, except when actions are performed as worship of God. This is the secret of work. This spiritual practice of performing all actions as worship of God, this spiritual practice will lead you to the satisfaction and peace in the Atman that is mentioned in chapter three of the Gita. This is the way uh, Krishna characterizes your liberation or independence. In this state where you are offering everything as worship of God, every thought, every feeling, every perception, every action of the body, the mind, and all of its attendant, uh, the five organs of action and the five organs of perception. If you're offering all that as worship of God, then you achieve satisfaction and peace in the Atman, which is the way Krishna characterizes liberation or independence. You will be free from the tyranny of the gunas. You will be free when you act and think and behave and yes, when you think, speak and behave in that way, you will be free from the tyranny of the gunas. You will do your duties, as Krishna says, but without attachment or anxiety about results. Your only motive in working will be to set others by your example on the path of duty. In other words, you spontaneously become a leader of others. Whether you ever say a word about it, whether they ever acknowledge it openly, you will be a leader of others. And you can see this happen in the workplace. You can see this happen in social circles. When there is a person who's moving in this direction, who is motivated in this way, others are drawn to them. There's a way of putting it in the Chandi, that uh, the Chandi talks about the Divine Mother and uh, doing everything as worship of the Divine Mother, which is characterized as taking refuge in her. And it says, those who take refuge in the Mother become the refuge of others. So you have your duties, of course, as long as you're embodied, you will have your duties, but you will do them without attachment or anxiety about results because you've offered them to the divine presence in whatever form you 
conceptualize or worship that divine presence. Your only motive in working will be to set others by your own example on the path of duty. Which is a good place to stop, I think, because we've made these startling assertions about the gunas and about our being forced to act. I mean, they're startling to all of us who read them for the first time. Any comments or questions about what's been said so far? This is what's meant by studying the art of spirituality together. Let's do this together. What is this given rise to you in, in you? What do you, what are your thoughts in response to what's been said? Uh, Brother Shankara? Yes, Sonny. Uh, this might be slightly, well, it, it relates to karma yoga. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I've heard from Gandhi's point of view, Gandhi sees one of his interpretations of the Gita is that it shows what could happen when pure devastation occurs, when a war becomes inevitable. So Gandhi kind of sees the Gita as kind of a, a treatise for nonviolence. So I was wondering whether whether the Gita, whether the war in the Gita was necessary and whether it was inevitable. Um, because there are many people, including Krishna, who tried to avoid the war. Or are, are the implications of the Gita, like must we, was it important that we heard Krishna's lesson? Okay, yes, absolutely. It's important that we heard Krishna's lesson. Was the Kurukshetra war necessary? As you said, Krishna and others did everything they could to try to persuade the Kuravas not to do what they did, which made the war in the terms of the time, both inevitable and a righteous war. And as Krishna points out to Arjuna in absolutely unambiguous terms, it is the duty of a warrior to fight in a righteous war. Now in modern times, there have been some examples of this. George Patton is one. Um, you can study his life and see the life of a righteous warrior. Was he always right in everything he did? Of course not. None of us are always right in everything we do. We abide in ignorance until it's otherwise. As, as Rama points out to his the Lakshmana about uh, Vashishta's weeping about his sons. He who has illumination or wisdom also has ignorance as long as they're embodied. <clears throat> so Gandhiji, in seeing the Gita as a rationale for nonviolence, was just as right as Arjuna was to go ahead and fight the Kurukshetra war or for that matter, George Patton to lead the third army in the second world war. It is preposterous to say that human beings will not make war. Human beings will make war. How much history do we have to have? So to participate in it or not to participate in it, our beloved Swami Yogeshananda chose not to participate in World War II and was part of a civilian program um, of uh, uh, alternative service. And some people reviled him for it. It did not matter what they thought of him. 
he based his decision on his own understanding, his own self-determination. If we look at that through the lens of what Krishna said, he was listening to the intelligent will because he'd already headed down that path. Thank you for asking that question, Sonny. That is a question that inevitably comes up with regard to the Gita. Yes, the Kurukshetra war was, from Krishna's point of view, a righteous war that could not be avoided, and it was the duty, the absolute sworn, if you will, duty of a righteous warrior to participate. And of course, it's a metaphor for our own participation in the fight against uh, the tyranny of the gunas. Thank you, Sonny. Thank you. Anything else? Brother Sankara Amanjula again. Um, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for such wise commentary. Appreciate it. Um, one of my thoughts or questions is about not doing action versus doing action, maybe even with selfish intentions. Because sometimes some of my friends argue or comment, well, everything is set like Maya. What is the purpose? They, I am more action oriented by nature. Mm -hmm. I'm always trying to do something towards what I think a goal, either at work or in my personal life or in the community. Good, 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 wonderful. <laughs> so not necessarily always good acts, but I'm very action oriented. And some of my friends think that I worry too much, I stress too much with all these actions. And a lot of it is already emotion. Um, so my question uh, is, if you can comment on, they're not bad people, they're good people, is no action. Even when you know what is the right action, is that better than doing some action? Oh, Krishna. Believing in what you believe in. Krishna says, Krishna says, don't choose the path of no action. Mm -hmm. And then he says, you can't anyway. Mm -hmm. Blinking your eyes is an action. Having a thought is an action. Worrying is an action. All these mm -hmm. things, if you don't act, hmm, uh, no, better to act and learn by your actions yes. than not acting. Mm -hmm. Krishna is absolutely, as you say, you read chapter three, you see, he says. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he says, basically, you don't have any choice but to act. The gunas are what's doing the acting. You think you are deciding. And this business about everything being preordained by Maya, it's not preordained in any way. Karma is constantly changing every instant. As it says in the Chandi, Mother brings about minutes, moments, and other divisions of time in order to bring about change in things. And so things are always changing. This is the nature of Maya. And so this whole preordination routine is just a way of being mentally lazy, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Shankar. And another thought I want to share with so much happening, uh, maybe we're more aware of injustices now than we were before. Either way, <clears throat> my personal thinking is based on history, what happened in Europe and across the centuries. No action on good people, on part of good people, causes a lot more damage than the actions of people who are not that good. So, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but I, I see that happening in our own country. Well, and I, course, I just want to share that. Of course, the, the, the Holocaust survivors, including Elie Wiesel, 
he's the one who very explicitly said what you just said. It is the inaction of good people that allows the wicked to triumph. Yes. So we must act as Gandhiji acted, as Martin Luther King acted, and all those who followed them sincerely, some of whom died, some of whom were badly injured, and some of whom became triumphant leaders afterwards in both India and here in the United States. I'm thinking here in the, in the Atlanta area of the man, John Lewis. Yes, yes, yes. So was he willing to get in good trouble? Yes, he was willing to get in good trouble. Now, I don't want to get off on a political tangent here, but this is a time that tests all of us. Yes. This is a time that tests all of us. What will we do in the face of what is happening? And uh, so we, in each of us has to make our own decision and learn as the results of our decision. And will we make mistakes? Why did Vivekananda said, I fall a thousand times, I rise a thousand and one times. Yes, we will make mistakes. We will skin our knees, we will bloody our noses. But that's never a reason not to act. Hey, this is Tom. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, Tom. So I'm, uh, I'm, I feel self-conscious when I repeat a conversation from probably 12 or 15 years ago. I don't have perfect memory, but uh, I think it relates to this discussion. Swami Yogeshananda said in a, in a conversation 12 or 15 years ago that I don't remember perfectly, that knowing what he knew then, he would have fought in World War II. Uh, knowing about the death camps and so on and attempt to exterminate the Jews. So uh, I just had a feeling he would like me to chime in here now. Well, thank that. you. Thank you for adding that, Tom. That's the first time I've heard that. And that is quintessentially Swami Yogeshananda who learned from his experiences and, and did the manana necessary, did the mental... Uh, work necessary to come to different conclusions than he came to at that time. Beautiful. Yes. A friend of mine and I were just talking about that uh, the other day. His father was also a conscientious objector and was put in jail for not going. And But his father at the time was unaware of how bad the Nazis were. All he knew was World War I, which was just a pointless loss of life and blood and money and everything. So that's what that's what a lot of people saw when they were told to fight in World War II was, you know, World War I was just stupid, which a lot of wars are, unfortunately. Yes. Yes, well, everyone makes either by omission or by commission, makes up their own mind what they're going to do at any given time. Those who are diligent will be constantly, and we'll talk about this a bit later, they're constantly evaluating as the Swami did, as remarked by Tom Carr, remark, they're evaluating what they did before and saying, now that I know this, that was not perhaps the appropriate action. This is learning from experience. And this action and experience suit does learn from experience. However, it happens. Um, Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. This is Swayam. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, my question or rather maybe confusion is the, the definition of action is so broad. Not all of us are uh, born, you know, sort of that energetic leadership, go-getting type of personalities, and or the circumstances may be such that we cannot physically 
or mentally go and do these world changing um, work. But could uh, in that circumstance, just some small act like a smile or a kind word or prayer, sincere prayer for welfare, would that also constitute action? Of course it does, dear. Particularly when it is offered as worship of the divine, of course it can, and, and, and everybody is not going to be a world leader. This is not what Krishna means when he says you will set an example for others. He doesn't mean you will become a Joe Biden or uh, a Kamala Harris. No, though that's reserved for a very few. But each one is perfect and grand in their place. And so if you do, if you are living by these principles, you radiate something that is very unusual. If you're living by these principles that Krishna gives. And because of that, because of that, you have an effect on others. If you want to understand what I mean, read Swami Vivekananda's talk, Powers of the Mind. It's of course in his complete works. And he talks about the effect that we have. And of course, much work has been done on this since. A man named Pim Van Lommel wrote a book on consciousness. You can find it, it's still very much in print. He's still very active, he's a Dutchman. And his, his work on how much we affect one another completely subconsciously is really revelatory. So yes, you're absolutely right. A simple uh, <clears throat> offering somebody something uh, in the way of a, of, of a word, uh, a gesture that causes them to smile, that causes them to feel a little bit better. Uh, <clears throat> a, a, a sincere prayer on his <clears throat> behalf. Absolutely, we are not disconnected. We are connected. Thank you, Brother Shankara. Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. Uh, yeah, what's the name of the book by uh, I don't remember um, the exact title. It's it has the word consciousness is in it. Okay. And the author is Pim P I M. Next word V A N Van. Next word L O M M E L. Pim Van Lamo. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. And also, I think uh, most of us naturally focus on actions relating to physical actions, but not mental actions, because by nature, human beings are always acting, whether we're doing physical action or mental action is always going on. Am I yeah. right? Of course, and even, even below what we register in our waking awareness as our mental action. There's a great deal going on in our active subconscious and in our latent subconscious, which is also called the unconscious. This is constantly busy. And it is producing the causes that result in the effects we see in our waking awareness thoughts and actions. It's, it's going on constantly. And this is the actions of the gunas. This is what Sri Krishna means. If you, if you study the gunas, you see that the gunas are constantly working on your mental impressions. Most of our mental impressions are not available to us in our waking awareness until we begin to practice contemplation, concentration, and meditation. Then slowly and slowly they become available to us. But they're constantly being uh, 
<clears throat> activated mm -hmm. by the gunas. And so what we think is my thought, my feeling, my perception, just get rid of the word my. There is a thought, there is a feeling, there is a perception. It is the work of the divine through the instrumentality of the gunas. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that brings up the very next point that is was in the notes here. To practice this, that the Sri Krishna is recommending to Arjuna, <clears throat> you will keep constantly in mind that every action, and this is a quote from the Gita, every action is really performed by the Hello? You will keep constantly in mind that every action is really performed by the gunas and be free from the self-centered delusion that you are the doer. You will keep constantly in mind, and this is the quote, every action is really performed by the gunas. End of quote. And therefore be free from the self-centered delusion that you are the doer then and therefore you can dedicate all your actions to the lord the creator and master of the gunas because you see they aren't mine they are yours O lord and master of the gunas whether you call her mother or whether you call her krishna or call him krishna or whatever you call the the divine presence if you call it anything at all <clears throat> but you can then dedicate all your actions, which includes your thoughts, your perceptions, and so on, to that divine presence, the creator and master of the gunas. And if you do as Krishna instructs, without hedging your bets, and that's what he says, don't have any mental reservations, don't hedge your bets, don't try to keep one foot in worldliness, and one foot in this. No. Both feet on one side or both feet on the other. Don't hedge your bets. If you do as Krishna instructs without hedging he, your bets, if you do as Krishna instructs without hedging your bets, he promises you will be released from the bondage of your karma which is another way of saying you'll be free from the tyranny of the gunas. You will be released from the bondage of your karma. <clears throat> and he says, <clears throat> he, he sees the, the immediate and natural ob objection to this. Well, yeah, but I, I, I like this and I don't like that. And, uh, you know, the, 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 there's, uh, the, the world is, is full of, um, goods and bads and this and that and the other thing. He says this natural attraction and aversion for sense objects and sense objects are thoughts as well as uh, as uh, actions uh, and and things of the, that you that your senses can be drawn to. This natural attraction and aversion for sense objects is natural. That's not hedging your bets. The fact that you are drawn to this and averse from that. He said, but he says, Krishna says not to indulge in these feelings because they're obstacles. Be aware of them. Even sometimes you'll give in to them. But when you do, just be aware, that's what I did. Let it go, don't beat yourself up about it. But just be aware that this attraction and aversion routine is an obstacle because it is a diversion, it is a distraction from where your attention is most auspiciously kept. 
And he says, Krishna says, senses are higher than sense object. Mind is higher than the senses. The intelligent will is higher than the mind. Higher than the intelligent mind is the Atman. Now this is the construct. This is the frame of reference, the, the Weltanschauung, the worldview of Sankhya. My senses are higher than sense objects. <clears throat> so Vivekananda says, that being true, the mind need not be controlled by the sense objects. Matter doesn't control your mind. Mind controls matter. So senses are higher than sense objects. Mind is higher than the senses. The intelligent will, the buddhi, and now we've crossed the line from the seeming separate individual which is a reflection of the great cause and its first crystallization, if you will, as the intelligent will, that which can tell one thing from another. And then the next thing that arises in the Sankhya formulation is the Ahamkara, the eye maker, who is deciding. Who is telling one thing from another? That reflects in us these two things. The great cause reflects in us as the causal body. The intelligent will reflects in us. The, that discriminating faculty reflects in us as the buddhi. And the ahamkara reflects in us as the sense of I-ness. Then we cross over from that to the organs of perception and the organs of action, the five organs of each. This is where we seem to be separate because we have this sense of I perceiving organs of perception and doing organs of action. So, Krishna is very explicit in saying, the senses are higher than the sense objects. Mind is higher than the senses. The intelligent will, the buddhi, is higher than the mind. Higher than the intelligent will is the atma, the great cause. <clears throat> and so, again, a quote from the Gita. You must know him who is above the intelligent will get control of the mind through spiritual discrimination, spiritual contact with the buddhi through spiritual practice. So then you see behind that intelligent will, you see the great cause. Spiritual discrimination is the highest function of the buddhi, and we only come to it through the path of karma by following Krishna's instructions, which can be summarized as, make the effort to keep constantly in mind that, quote, every action is really performed by the gunas, unquote. And remind yourself the feeling that I am the doer is the fundamental self-centered delusion. So that's the first instruction. From Krishna. Make the effort to keep constantly in mind that every action is really performed by the gunas and remind yourself that the feeling I am the doer is the fundamental self-centered delusion that keeps us hypnotized. When you do those two things, therefore, you are able to dedicate all your actions because you see they come from the great cause, the Lord. Therefore, you can dedicate all your actions to the Lord, the creator and master of the gunas. 
Now, the first set of instructions is a form of manana. The second is devotion. So this manana and devotion will give you peace of mind. The peace of mind needed to be in the presence of your intelligent will in its highest form. It will allow you to participate in the witness awareness that everything is happening in your presence. Every thought, every feeling, every perception, every action is happening in your presence. What is the witness? The witness of the, is the face of the Atman. And then last, after you cross that line between your sense of separate individuality and your sense of being one with the divine, then at last you have access to the Atman. So I'll read that again. This manana in devotion will give you the peace of mind needed to be in the presence of your intelligent will, your witness awareness, and then at last, the Atman. We're right on schedule. Time for comments and questions from anyone about any of this. Brother Shankara? Yes, Vijay. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, from time to time, by asking you a question about uh, the gunas, I am trying to capture the sentiment that you have tried to provide to me about the gunas. Today, let me make a statement for you to correct me where I'm wrong, if I'm wrong. Based on what I've learned from you, my understanding of the gunas is, it's like a breeze. First, the gunas don't belong to me. Second, gunas are like a breeze. Is a breeze of sattva, a breeze of... Uh, 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 yeah, the, the breeze of the three gunas flowing. And it is uh, depending on my propensities, how much of each of those gunas I partake no, 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 you don't have any choice about how much of the gunas you partake. You only have control of your reaction to what happens in the presence of what happens as the gunas interact with your karma, your mental impressions. They are, they are, we just have to get rid of this idea of mind. Those mental impressions, for most of them, are not even had. They don't even have to do with is this incarnation as VJ. If we're to believe the scriptures, they're ancient, and so it it arises in us as this is my thought, this is my feeling, this is my perception based on the breeze of the gunas. No, no, no. It is a thought a feeling, a perception produced by the interaction of the breeze of the gunas with this uh, great field of wind chimes that is all our past mental impressions right up to this moment. But even what has happened in this moment is not ours. It's only the divine's. This sense of separation, this sense of me, mine, is, is, is the fundamental error. I am the doer. I am the perceiver. No. So is that true that neither I am the cause nor I am the effect of the gunas? I mean... You are most certainly not the mm -hmm. cause of the gunas. The, the effect of the gunas on what exists as you right now. The, these, this, these mental impressions 
these the the karma that you brought to this moment so it is happening right now in this lifetime every moment yes yes okay. and, and and not only is it happening this moment but this moment transitions into the next moment and the next moment and the next moment and the only reason that it seems like time is passing is because of the effect of the gunas because it brings about change in things and so we think we we, we think we're experiencing time passing This takes me back to another question then. Granted that gunas are not mine, I'm not the doer, then why do the karmas are said to be mine? The, the karmas are not yours. You will feel their effects as long as you see, see yourself as the doer and the experiencer. The karmas are not yours. Nothing is yours. No thing is yours. Because in the most fundamental sense, we don't even, and this is where Vashishta teaches Rama. In the most fundamental sense, we don't really exist. This is a dream of Brahman, Brahman's dream. <clears throat> and it is a dream existence and is no more has a reality in, 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 in the capital R reality than our dreams at night have a reality in this relative reality or for that matter our daydreams as vivekananda put it we are infinite dreamers dreaming finite dreams the whole idea of i me mine is a fiction we are the we are the divine being experiencing and expanding itself. That's the conclusion of the great teachers and the saints. And uh, every moment that we th spend thinking that I am the doer, I am the experiencer, is one in which we will then also experience the results of thinking in that way of separation. Can I make a comment? Please, Tom. Okay, so the way I see this for me is uh, <clears throat> the whole thing about I am not the doer and so on is a tool, a linguistic tool, a tool in language to take me beyond language. And if I try to analyze it too carefully, it's full of contradictions. Like when he says, remind yourself that you are not the doer. Well, he's telling me to do something. Uh, it's not like philosophically solid because language can't be philosophically solid. You're absolutely right. Tom. It's a tool, a tool for liberation. And my experience with it is that sometimes these type things will cause me just to drop all language and all conceptual thinking and i will uh i will understand something that i can't put into words now but it makes me very happy and i laugh yes exactly so uh yes language yeah, so is inherently limited it because I, because i have a sort of like a philosophical and a linguistic bent i can get caught up in all of this like trying to analyze it to death and say, well, this couldn't be true and this blah, blah, blah. That's not the purpose of it, at least for me. No, you're absolutely right. And that's why Sri Krishna says, try not to hedge your bets. Just, just 
just do what I say and see what happens. May I offer my thought, Brother Shankar? Of course, dear. Thank you. Um, I think my challenge it has been and is intellectually and philosophically, I see, I understand what you're saying, what Krishna says. Mm -hmm. Whether I'm there, I am not. Um, I think I do, I'm driven a little more by success or accomplishment, or we can maybe call that ego, even when I'm doing good things. So I'm just sharing that. Doesn't mean that I don't want to work towards this completely what you're saying, Krishna says, which do everything for God. Because I really honestly don't think of God as much. <laughs> well, of course not, dear. I this think is, of this is what the, I'm doing and why I'm doing. This is and for a big good causes most of the time. So yes. just offering my conflicted view well, of this. Thank I, you. I, and thank you for being so sweet and sincerely honest. That's you have expressed the condition of all of us. All of us. If we weren't in that condition, we would be illumined. And even then, as Tom Carr just pointed out, you, you, you're you here and then you're there, you're here and then you're there. Sometimes you something happens in your presence that you understand but could never put into words. And it makes you laugh because it is so beautiful and so characterize it how you will. In the meantime, <laughs> we are these infinite beings or the one infinite being <clears throat> having these finite dreams. And that doesn't take anything away from it. As a matter of fact, it glorifies it. What a position to be in when we really can sit in that witness chair and say, my God, what you are doing and what you have done. Look at this. In all of its glory and all of its horror and all of its complexity and all of its simplicity, there's the simplicity of a bee asleep in the heart of a flower. And there is the, 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 the incredible geopolitical madness that is, surrounds us. All an example of the creativity of the divine. So when we can be in that witness chair and say, you know, Francis Ford Coppola was a good filmmaker, but my Lord, the film you are producing, Lord. Mm -hmm. it, it, this frees us, it frees us. That's what we want. We want freedom, we want happiness. We want to, as Tom Carr said, we want to just sit back and laugh. But at other times, because of our spiritual practices, we will be brought to tears. But the magnificence of what is going on around us in its tiniest forms, the Higgs boson, in its grandest forms, the still not understood cosmic background radiation. And all of its fruits. And those are just two physical examples. Thank you.
thank you for your honesty. Brother Shankar? Yes, Sonny. Um, so I'm still a little new to this Gita study. Um, so I'm going to ask a very broad question. Oh, boy. Just broad. I mean, or simple. It might be simple. Um, what is the definition of karma yoga? And how does it relate to Dharma? That is a, um, that is a, even too broad a question for a doctoral dissertation, Sunny. Uh, but let's just say, what is karma yoga? Karma yoga is the understanding of what action is, why it is, and what our relationship to it is. How that relates to Dharma, that's such a big question. And, you know, there are there are four aspects to Dharma at the at a minimum. And how does it relate to each of them? Let's just take truthfulness, the one that is so mm, present to us right now. To be, to not be a hypocrite, to be truthful about who we are and what we are in this moment is a, is a huge victory all by itself. To be honest about what it is that is true for me. What do I really think? This is manana. What do I really think? How do I really speak? How do I really behave? This is the practice of karma yoga. Trying to keep in mind the principles that Krishna, that we reviewed from chapter three. And next week we'll take up chapter four where he goes from uh, principle to practice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's titled The Yoga of Renunciation. What does it mean to renounce all these ideas? And how do we go about renouncing all these ideas of I, me, mine? It's fascinating. But it's a good question, Sonny. Meditate on it for yourself. And, uh, and uh, let us know as the weeks go by what it is that you uh, what it is that you conclude brother shankara yes haima this is haima it's uh, one of our lectures in uh, 2019 uh, you gave us a little definition of karma yoga small and simple one i just had it written it's a it's a spiritual path that leads to the abandonment of selfishness and you also said, do not ask others to live by your views. When you ask, it is selfishness. These couple of things I wrote it down uh, that just kind of really helped in life as a mother, grandmother, or as a friend, or you know, not to ask others to live by your views is a very powerful statement of karma yoga. I just wanted to mention to Sunny and my peers. Thank you so I'll, much. I'll, I'll, I'll read the definition again. It's, it's that, not really that's... definition. You just mentioned to us in our group discussion, Karma Yoga discussion. Yes, but here's, here is the definition with which I've started all uh, the talks okay. on Karma Yoga. Karma Yoga is a spiritual path leading to the abandonment of selfishness. Exactly, that's what you said to us. As a karma yogi, you practice offering your actions and their results, as well as your perceptions, thoughts, and feelings to the divine presence. Even before fully knowing this presence, you hold firmly to the belief that the presence is within each person or other living being 
that you interact with or serve. Working and abiding in this spirit, you are increasingly able to release attachment to your activities and their results. This yields the freedom and contentment promised by Karma Yoga. And here is the promise of freedom and contentment in one little distillation by Sri Krishna. Even a little practice of this yoga will save you from the terrible wheel of rebirth and death. And Sri, Sri Ramakrishna added to that by saying, practice just a little and someone will come forward to help you. Thank you, Brother Shekra. Yeah, thank you, Haima. Sure, Sunny. And also, there is a Sufi story about chickens, which I think you said it, Brother Shankara, that might help for you, Sunny. The Sufi about Sufi story about chickens and the pig. Uh, it's in the book too. It's in our Karma Yoga book by Vivekananda, I think. Either Karma Yoga or Raja Yoga. Just one. Would you like me to tell the story, Haima? Is that what you're? Inviting? Please do, Brother Shankara. It's a wonderful story. I, I wrote it. I tell my grandchildren all the time. <laughs> a Sufi teacher had four students. One day, at the end of the lesson, he opened a basket and gave them each a live chicken. Yeah. And he, as they went away, his instruction was, go to some place where no one can see you to kill this chicken and then bring the cooked chicken back next week next week came all four students came three came with their cooked chickens and the fourth came back with his live chicken. And the instructor said, I thought I told you what to do with this chicken. And the student said, yes, but master, I could find nowhere where the Lord could not see me. And the, the teacher celebrated his student. <clears throat> understanding. The eye with which I see God is the eye with which God sees me, Meister Eckhart. The eye of the eye, the ear of the ear, the speech of the speech. This is Brahman. It's so hard for us to get our minds around. This is why it's so important to practice spiritual disciplines because our mind will never understand. There's something else in us that as Tom Carr points out, understands. But that understanding is not of the left literal language mind but it is a profound and real understanding. And we only come to that by spiritual practice. And one of the spiritual practices is keeping the, these two things in mind. I am not the doer. The gunas are the doer. I am not the doer. And therefore, everything is being done and produced by the master of the gunas and so therefore i offer it all back to that divine presence and whatever happens i take as the prasad as the gift of that divine presence now is it easy no it's not easy it's simple in concept, but it's not easy. And that's why Sri Ramakrishna, as we'll talk about it another time, 
Sri Ramakrishna says, these other paths, these other three paths, they're not the most auspicious for this time. And he has reasons for it. And if you want to read what he has to say, beautifully, beautifully, beautifully said, you can go to the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna and start on page 132. And uh, just read that. It's chapter 5 of volume 1. And he talks about these various paths and their, their pros and cons and concludes for us that the path of devotion is the easiest and most auspicious for his time. But we're talking this month about karma yoga. So next week we'll talk about the yoga of renunciation. Chapter 4 of the Gita. Uh, one last question. Yes, Sonny. So um, the Gita fundamentally is about karma yoga first and foremost? No, 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 no. Oh, no. No, oh. He, he, starts, he starts with karma yoga because within the framework of Sankhya and the time and place in which the Gita is delivered, it was the most auspicious for that time. Remember, this is the Bronze Age. This is the this is the end toward the end of the Bronze Age. And so transitioning from the Bronze Age into the Iron Age, the foundation was this Karma Yoga based on the idea get rid of these ideas, get rid of this uh, predisposition to think of yourself as, as the owner and the doer. Sri Ramakrishna says, as we're transitioning from the Iron Age, the Kali Yuga, into the new Golden Age or Satyuga, the most auspicious practice is of the yoga of devotion or bhakti yoga which Sri Krishna covers very lovingly in chapter 12 of the Gita. <clears throat> he also talks about uh, the, the about jnana yoga and raja yoga is just built in. I mean the, the, the idea of, of uh, what uh, Patanjali formalized as the workbook, the Yoga Sutra. Um, it's just built into practically every chapter of the Gita that you're practicing um, contemplation, concentration, and meditation. So yeah, it it's, was foundational when the Gita was spoken. Karma Yoga. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And 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 Vivekananda taught them all four. He taught work, worship, psychic control, Raja Yoga, and philosophy, Jnana Yoga. Taught them all four. That's that's why we do that here. And we just, we don't try and tell people other than what Sri Ramakrishna said. We don't try and tell people what is the best for them. It's not up to, it's not up to this place to tell you what's best for you. I mean, we, you can come and we can have a conversation about it, but ultimately I'll say you should seek Diksha, and, um, initiation and <clears throat> the uh, the refuge of the Swami in charge of offering Diksha. Anything else from anyone? This is beautiful. This is exactly how it should go. Yes. Um, I'm fairly new to Vedanta. I just started sitting with y'all uh, during quarantine last year. 
and I try to pay attention and, and learn as much as I can. And today, after what uh, Tom said, I, I kind of got on this Ferris wheel of uh, if we're the infinite having a finite dream, and yet we're trying to get off of this treadmill of birth and rebirth, I, I don't really understand how those things connect where we're uh, the, uh, why our ego is necessary because of the, if we're the infinite and then, and I don't even know if I'm explaining that correctly, but uh, it, there seems to be a slight paradox there I can't. Uh, oh, yes, indeed. Understand. So thank you if you can explain anything in that category for me. Since the fundamental premise is that there, that consciousness is primary and is not plural, consciousness being the divine presence or Brahman or the one, consciousness is primary and is not plural. But it seems to us to be plural, doesn't it? I mean, it's absolutely incontrovertible. There are so many squares on the screen here, or rectangles on the screen, and more that I can't see. We seem to be plural. Why? In the Chandogya Upanishad, it says, the cosmic mind in a state of perfect equilibrium, no, no manifestation of any kind, the cosmic mind comes up with the thought, I am one, I shall become many. So, manyness evolves. And the process of its evolution is described by the physicists in one way, described in the Vedas another, uh, described by the Christian, Judeo-Christian tradition in another. Nevertheless, from from what appeared to be nothing arose what we see now. Because we are that divine being, the conclusion is inevitable. This is happening because I want it to happen. I like it. I like to be in the presence of many. <clears throat> now, why to get off? Why to get off the treadmill or the Ferris wheel? By the way, Cindy Craven wrote a beautiful song using that Ferris wheel metaphor. You can find it in her music files. Um, Sri Chaitanya characterized it as being a weary soul. We're just tired of it. We're just tired. We're enough, enough. So he speaks of it in one way. And Swami Vivekananda, in the last pages of chapter four of Raja Yoga, speaks of it very poetically in another. Swami Vivekananda's description of it is more organic. It, it's just a, a natural, we come to the end of a process. And so then we, as individuals, vanish. Return to what is beyond the gunas. <clears throat> or above the gunas. But until we do sincerely want that, where is the motivation? or getting off the treadmill. But let me just say, let me just 
recite for you what Chaitanya says. Chant the name of the Lord and his glory unceasing, that the mirror of the heart may be wiped clean and quenched that mighty forest fire, worldly lust raging furiously within. O name stream down in moonlight on the lotus heart, opening its cup to knowledge of thyself. O self, drown deep in the waves of his bliss, chanting his name continually, tasting his nectar at every step, bathing in his name, that bath for weary soul. Bathing in his name, purification washing away that which keeps us distracted, fixated, bathing in his name, that path of worship. This is a description of the bhakti path, the path of devotion by Chaitanya. <clears throat> So those, there's no inherent reason for wanting to get off. It's, look, look around us. There are a, a, a few billion people who are not making much of an effort, if any, to, uh, to get off. It's only a few. And Krishna has a formulation in the Gita for you do the math, it comes out to one in a million. He's going to succeed in getting off. But there's no reason that can't be each and every one of these that is represented by a rectangle on this screen today. Why not you? if that's what you want. And there is an assumption that because you spend the time with you and these others, spend the time with these talks and classes, that there is a desire to separate yourself from the distraction and from the tyranny of the Gitas, or the Gunas, <laughs> the, tyranny of the, the tyranny of the Gunas. Because it is a tyranny. Does that get it, Dennis? That helps a lot, Brother Shankar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anything else before we wind it up? I think um, the practice of Vedanta can become very overwhelming. So I find it best to, to just like take take the small steps and not 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 be like so overwhelmed by the huge mountain i have to climb but just focus on the small steps i can make every day oh that's exactly right Aaron. if you look at the mountain it's easy to get dumped you have to be one of those everest climbers too that's challenged by that and there are a few but for most of us you're just absolutely right just focus on what's necessary today. Trying to trying to keep that recollectedness. Thanks for bringing that up. Brother Shankara? Yes, I'm up. Can everybody really understand Bhagavad Gita without knowing Mahabharata? Because we may, you know, few of us, we grown up in India, we know Ramayana, Bhagavata, and Mahabharata essence of it at least we may not know yet to see everything but we have been we have been taught like just like uh, jesus christ in western world they have been taught about jesus christ from a to z we only understand the little bit of essence of jesus uh, just like that can they really understand gita without knowing mahabharata that's my this is this is why swami prabhavananda did the translation that he did with Christopher Isherwood to make it very smooth English, very appealing English. 
with those appendices at the back okay. and Aldous Huxley's introduction in the beginning so that it we get a framework for what it is that's being I see. said and then we if we understand the frame of reference from which Krishna is speaking the cosmology of the Gita the nature of the Kurukshetra war that's right. uh, which is explained in these appendices at the back of Swami Peace, then I think we can understand. But it always needs to have some basha, even for Indians yeah, who have yeah. grown up with it. Definitely. There's always need for some exposition. Sure. Because uh, as, as it was pointed out by more than one person, there are contradictions and paradoxes here. Yeah. And, and so Sri Ramakrishna, faced with this difficulty by more than one devotee, said, there's really only one solution. And he said, you must come into the neighborhood of God. And then all of these paradoxes, contradictions, and problems resolve themselves. And it happens in precisely the way that Tom Carr talked about you understand or realize something that is of the right mind or the heart not of the left brain literal language centers and i just love the way he said and it makes me laugh yes we 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 get amused at the way we behave otherwise and you know this is one of the reasons i keep recommending that book love poems from god to people because every one of those saints in there speaks about their laughter their tears too but the laughter the fact that there is real joy As Sri Ramakrishna says, quoting, I think, either Ramprasad or Kamalakanta, he says, the world transforms from a hell into a mansion of mirth. Thank you, Brother Shankar. I just have one last comment about what Tom has uh, said and you said about, I am not the doer. That has been manipulated by several people in India, especially in villages, when they do something wrong, oh, it's all God made me do it. it mm -hmm. Some people forget to take personal responsibility by knowingly that they know they are doing wrong. They just don't take the personal responsibility, leave everything to God, and that's not fair either. It's been manipulated by several people in India, I have to say that. That's why there are constables. Yes. That's yes. why there are constables. Yes, thank you so much. It was a wonderful discussion today. Um, Brother Shankara? Yes, sir. I just wanted to pitch in for my personal um, experience with the both uh, love poems from God and the uh, Guru initiated mantra. Mm -hmm. There is just something in both of those that helps at the most difficult moments even without food, full concentration just repeating the mantra mm -hmm. and reading whatever poem comes the way to get through that the, that moment moment by moment of difficult times i mean it, it is just amazing thank you swayam yes it's true so diksha there is there is a magic in diksha the reason we, as we understand it, is because it contains Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother's um, spiritual treasure and power. And then the love poems from God. This is the testimony of 12 realized souls um, in the most uh, engaging and kind of modern language translation interpretation um that uh, is so accessible to us so it's it it's uh anyway if if you want to just 
tip, dip your toe into that particular book without uh, committing yourself to it. Just come to our Monday evening reading and discussion group, which is, there's a <clears throat> Zoom link in the newsletter and on the Facebook page and so on. <clears throat> um, to our Monday evening reading and discussion group where we read poems from that book. And we're right now reading St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, who's a stunning intellect and great mystic. <clears throat> Anything else from anyone? All right. <clears throat> Let there be peace. Oh, by the way, this is a translation by our beloved Swami Yogeshananda of this ancient prayer for peace. Let there be peace in outer space. Let there be peace in the sky, on the earth, and in the waters. Let there be peace in the herbs, the plants, and the trees. May the gods be peaceful. May the whole universe be pervaded by peace. Let that infinite universal peace prevail throughout my being. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all beloved beings. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai Durga 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 May you be safe May you be healthy May you be cheerful May you have peace of mind Please go forward in Mother's loving and protective embrace Thank you Brother Shekhar Tom Carr, are you still there? I think Tom Carr, I think Tom Carr signed off. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you, Sonny. Thanks for coming. See you later, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Brother Shankara. Thank you, everyone.